Hello and welcome to Valley Christian. We're the Riccios. We're an imperfect people serving a perfect God. Let's go ahead and pray for the service. Father, you're good and your love is so great. There's nothing that can even come close nor compare to you, Lord. Be with us in our walks and our journeys for you, Lord, and help us to grow in striving to be more like you every day. Father, lead us by your spirit and help us not be led into temptation, but rather to be focusing on you, Lord. Help Delano and his sermon, Lord, speak through him, not his words, but rather your words be said, Lord. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We hope you have a great service. I 
worship you, you way maker, miracle worker, you promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, you promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. about a young boy who befriended a caterpillar he found in his backyard. Every single day, the boy would go outside to visit his friend. He'd watch him crawl and he would hold him. One day when he went outside though, he noticed that his friend was in a cocoon and it made him really sad because he wouldn't be able to play with him, but he decided that he would still visit him every single day. And after a couple of weeks, he noticed that the cocoon was shaking. He watched it for over an hour, and then he decided to help his friend. He didn't want to see his friend, the caterpillar, struggle or suffer. And so he ran and got a pair of scissors, and he carefully and gently cut open the cocoon so that his friend could come out. But when his friend emerged, its body was big and swollen, and its wings were short and stubby. After a short period of time, the caterpillar died. Even though the boy had really good intentions, what he didn't realize was that the struggle was important. There was purpose in that struggle. It's the struggle in that tight cocoon that forces the fluid out of the caterpillar's body to create and form its wings so that it could be transformed into a beautiful butterfly. Just like the butterfly struggle serves a purpose, our sufferings serve a purpose. Our suffering matters. Our suffering counts for something in Christ. It is not fruitless. It is not pointless. The scriptures talk about how God can accomplish great good in us through it. And this passage comes to mind in Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 3. It says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You know, I know personally, I do not like to struggle. And I don't think any of us would, would say, hey, sign me up to suffer. But I know in those really dark times in my life that this scripture has been fulfilled, that character has been formed and that I have been given hope because it's really during those hard times that I've been able to draw closer to God, that my trust in him has gotten deeper, my faith has increased, and he really has been able to transform me more into the likeness of Jesus. There's a saying, what the caterpillar thinks is the end, the butterfly knows it's only the beginning. Whatever struggles you have gone through in the past, whatever sufferings you are experiencing even right now today, and whatever struggles and sufferings may come, I hope we can use all of them to be transformed for God's glory. My minutes are up. Let's have a great week living and loving in Him. So
Thank you for joining us again for 
our Sunday morning worship service. We are super glad that you're here. I just wanted to take care of a couple of housekeeping things, especially for those that plan on attending an in-person service or have been attending in-person services. We have updated our meeting schedule for the rest of the year all the way through January 31st of 2022. That can be found on the calendar, on the app, and on the website. We have great news that we are going to be selling, celebrating 30 years as a church, and uh, that's actually August. And we want to do a big celebration, but we have to postpone it till October. Uh, just a lot of things going on with COVID right now, but um, this is a celebratory month for us. And so if you could keep us in prayer, that would be great as we celebrate 30 years of existence. And one final thing, especially for those that have just moved into the city, those who have been baptized or restored back to the faith, on September 18th at 12 p.m. here at the Smoke Ranch Building, we are going to have a new members luncheon. And you should be contacted by our deacons, but if not, you know that it's on September 18th at 12 p.m. here at the Smoke Ranch Building, 5317 Smoke Ranch Road. If you have any questions, please email us on the contact page on our website, valleychristianswithaness.org. Let's go to God in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you so much for your love. Thank you that you have kept us and protected us in so many ways. Father, as COVID ramps up again, not just here, but all over the country, we ask for your blessings. We pray special prayers for those who have contracted COVID, those that are really right now in the midst of fighting uh, for their health, God. I pray that you will move in powerful ways to bring healing and rest restoration, uh, Father of health. We ask, Lord, that you just be with your people all over the world, our brothers and sisters who uh, struggle day to day, Father, in countries where they're persecuted, in countries even where they're killed. We ask, Lord, that your light will shine bright in the midst of this darkness. Be with us as we continue to study out Matthew. Help us not just to be listeners of the word, but doers of the word. Father, help us to follow Jesus with our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We have been talking about Jesus working on our inner life, not just our outer life. But this morning, we're going to talk about outer performance or inner devotion. Which one do you think Jesus desires most? We talked last week, Matthew 5, 5, 17 through 48, some of the major points. Jesus addresses the inner life that should drive the behavior that is seen by all. The righteousness of the teachers of the law did not go below the surface, but the righteousness God seeks starts in the heart, Psalm 51 verse 6. And the question that was asked is, do we have this kind of heart to love like our Father and to be righteous on the inside, not just the outside? And my prayer is that these studies have really helped us to develop a healthy inner life, not just focused on being religious, but really focused on being devoted to the Lord and righteous from the inside through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the power of Christ, rather than just on our own power, acting religious, all right? So speaking of acting, you know, one of the things going into chapter 6, a word that is used by Jesus is hypocrites, okay? Hypocrites in the Greek. And basically, hypocrites in the first century were basically actors, in the theater, people or actors would play more than one character, and they would use masks to de depict the different characters they were portraying. And Jesus uses this concept of hypocrite uh, when he applies it to the scribes and the Pharisees. Why? Because they were acting. They were acting for their audience. And many of the references and the way that Jesus talks about uh, these things in the first few verses of chapter 6, you're going to begin to see that Jesus is calling us as his followers and calling all that would be his followers to live from the inside out, not the outside only. So 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 through 18, Jesus gives examples to his disciples on how it looks to live out their inner lives as his devoted followers and how not to be religious actors that live for the recognition of men. We know that actors get their real pleasure and meaning a lot of times from pleasing the people they're performing for and recognition. Hollywood has whole shows that... um, award shows that just basically recognize the best actors. And that's not what we want to see in church. That's not what we want to see in Christianity. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, Jesus says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Now, when Jesus is talking about your righteousness, and he's talking about right actions, actions that are prescribed by the law, actions that fall in line with maybe what God expects and what God has commanded them to do. They're righteous acts. They're not sinful acts. They're righteous acts. What makes them unfruitful or unrewarded is the audience for which they are performed. Jesus is basically telling his disciples Don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees. In other words, change your audience. Change your audience from man to God. When you act, when you do, when you you perform for men, that's your reward. In full. But when we live and when we do the things emanating from the heart that, that, that are a result in our outer actions, when God is our audience. Jesus says that we will be rewarded by God. I believe now and later. But we don't do it for the reward. We do it out of love for God. He is our audience, and we want to please Him. And we could only really do that as Christians through His power and His strength that He gives us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so here's here's an example of doing things for the recognition of man versus the recognition from God. Here are some things that would be said if you're trying to do it for man versus recognition from God. Where's my thanks? If it's all about man, we're going to be looking for thanks. Not from God, but from people. We want that recognition. But when we do it for God, we don't need thanks. No thanks needed. It's a pleasure to serve. Jesus said himself that the greatest in the kingdom is the one who is a slave to all, the one who serves. Recognition for man gets an attitude if the leader doesn't recognize them publicly. If someone does an act or act of service or is a pillar in the church and isn't recognized publicly and they get an attitude, wrong audience. Recognition from God, one has an attitude of being grateful to be able to put their gifts to work for God and his people. The man looking for recognition from from other men, they ask, what's in it for me? Where the person seeking God's approval says, how can I serve others? I hope people see my sacrifice. Wrong audience. I pray God is pleased and glorified with my life. That's the audience. God is that's who we should be trying to please and trying to find approval from, from God. Verse 2, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So here we have Jesus addressing something that is very common in the Jewish religious world. Remember, he's talking to Jews here, giving to the poor. Now, Jesus actually addresses three different things, three areas of spiritual life, giving, prayer, and fasting. And what I want you to see is for Jesus and his followers, it's not If 
It's when. It's when you give to the poor, when you pray, when you fast, not if. So there is already in Jesus' teaching an expectation to do righteous things, to do things that are seen as pleasing to God. But I want us to understand that when we do righteousness, some, a, a definition of righteousness is integrity or virtue, purity of life, uprightness, correctness in thinking, feeling, and acting, giving to the poor, helping, helping the needy, praying and fasting. These are right things to do in the view of God. But Jesus says, do it in secret. So, I want to make sure we understand something very important. Jesus is not calling for us to be closet Christians, to hide our Christianity, to hide our following of Jesus. He doesn't want us to put the light that he has given to us, he doesn't want us to put it under a bowl. He's actually calling for properly motivated and devoted followers who do things out of love for God and people, not for their own glory, but for the glory of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. Jesus said, let your good works be seen so that they may glorify your Father in heaven. So when Jesus is talking to his disciples saying, do it in secret, he's talking about not, not hiding their righteous acts, but not doing it for show. Not doing it for men's approval, but doing it for God's approval, knowing that in our hearts we're seeking to please God, not seeking glory for ourselves in the eyes of man. Super, super important. Why? Because people need to see us doing good works. People need to see us doing things that God approves of. He doesn't want us to hide our Christianity he just wants us to properly do our Christianity with the proper motives and the proper incentives of not being rewarded here on earth by the approval of man, but doing it to the glory of God. And I believe he wants us to be generous in our giving when we help those in need. Again, it's not if, it's when. And it's important to understand that generosity comes when we give from the heart, not giving from compulsion. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 10, Paul says this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, what you've decided before the Lord to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to who? The poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Through And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Paul here was talking about a gift that was being collected for the church in Jerusalem. And Paul was encouraging the church in Corinth to be generous. And now I want us to understand this is not health and, and prosperity type of preaching. Paul is simply saying, you don't have to worry about whether or not God is going to meet your needs. Feel free to be joyfully generous. Now, if your heart right now is saying, you just want more money, that is not the heart that God wants you to have. And that is not the heart in which you should give. Bottom line is, Paul made it clear, give what is in your heart to give. And just let me say this for our Valley Christian family. Thank you. You guys are super, super generous. And even through the pandemic, you guys have continued to give, not only financially, but you have given of your hearts and you have given of your time, and you have given of your energy. And I just want to acknowledge that before the entire world or the people who watch this. The Valley Christian 
that family is awesome and they're generous. And I'm not saying this so that you could be more generous. I'm saying this because you are generous. But make sure in your generosity you are doing it not for recognition for man, but because you seek to please God and for him to be glorified. And Valley Christian family, your generosity is absolutely ringing true and ringing around the world uh, in thanksgiving to God for your generosity. And I just want to reiterate, you're going to be seeing next week a lesson from one of the churches that we support in our giving for special missions, a church in the Philippines. And they are super grateful. So I just want to send that message to the church family. They are super grateful for all the support. So going on in verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the actors, the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. When you go out, and this is not condemning public prayer. This is condemning prayer that is put on for a show so that they can be told how awesome they are. And you kind of get a sense when you're talking to someone, they talk like this, like that, like this. And then they do public prayer and they're, thou art holy, dear Lord. Give us us our daily. And you're like, wait a minute, what what, what just happened? You were having a conversation and you sounded one way and now you're doing public prayer and you sound like the King James version of the Bible. What's going on? We have to be careful that in our prayers, even when we're praying with brothers, even when we're praying with our spouse, even when we're praying with friends, that we're not putting on a show so that people are impressed by our words. But we want to approach the throne of grace with confidence and humility Understanding that we're entering into the presence of God who deserves all the glory. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So it is not about just God give us, God give us, God give us, God give us, God give us. It's not about finding the secret incantation that's going to unlock the spiritual door to blessings. Jesus says, God already knows what you need. He just wants you to pray to him, talk to him. And remember, he's talking to people who pray regularly, I think three to five times a day. They pray already. So, What is this pray in your closet or go into your room? Now, this is what a first century Jewish person would see as their prayer closet. Because they had, a, I believe it's called a tallit, a a shawl, a prayer shawl that they can put over their head, put over their face and create a room or create a space with intimacy with God. And so you can be in the midst of 30 people praying, and when we were in the, at the Western Wall, you saw hundreds of Jewish people praying, praying, and praying, reciting prayers, and many of them with prayer shawls over their heads or, or it's surrounding them. And so you could be in the midst of 30, 40, 50 people, and you put that prayer shawl around you. You have created a sacred space for you and God. And he says, when you do this, don't do it for show. Do it because you know your Heavenly Father knows what you need. Do it because you love God. Do it because you want to be with Him and have that relationship with Him. This is how we understand prayer room. That it's literally a room in which we pray. And the reason why I bring this up is because am I against prayer rooms? Absolutely not. Hey, if go, pray. Whatever you need to do to pray. But I want us to not read into, you know, our 21st century way of thinking into the scriptures. I want you to see it and experience the way they experienced it. Why? Because there was corporate prayer. They, they, they worshiped in, 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 in groups and in community. When we go into our prayer closet, we sometimes forget that 
we're in community. I'm grateful for the brothers like George Mena and, and Ed Kilty who kind of keep spearheading these different prayer times for the men in the church to get together to pray together. Again, not so they can see how awesome we are, but because when we pray, understand this, when Jesus says, pray like this, he says, our Father, there's community. But even within the community, there's opportunity for space to be created for intimacy between you and God. And we don't have to keep asking and asking and asking the same thing over and over and over again, thinking that by repetition, we're going to get what we want. He says that's what the pagans do. I believe we need to pray in faith. Thank God for, for what he provides. Ask for his will to be done. And then be grateful for the blessings that he gives. Because remember, not every answer to prayer is yes. And not every answer to prayer is no. Sometimes the answer is not yet. And so even in our asking, it's not in the multiple words we use, but I believe it's in the heart that wants to see God's will done. So Jesus teaches these people, and so Jesus teaches these people, his followers who are used to praying. He says, this is how you should pray. In verse 9, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. Notice, community, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There's all sense of community in this prayer. And yet... Jesus goes on to say in verse 14, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, singular, your Father, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, you say, why did Jesus single out that particular verse? And we'll get to that. But I just, there are many, many lessons that can be drawn from what, what is called the Lord's Prayer should really be called the Disciples' Prayer because Jesus wouldn't pray this prayer because he didn't sin. So this is more accurately deemed the Disciples' Prayer or the, the follower, uh, followers of Jesus' prayer. And basically, does he want us to repeat this over and over and over again? No, because that would contradict what he just said. But I believe this is a pattern. This is an outline. This is a, a guide of how we should approach God. I'm not going to take the time to go through each part. Why? Because many of you have heard it over and over and over again. But I want us to see something very interesting. Is the prayer that Jesus is telling them to pray is not a, in, in general, is not a new prayer. It's an Amida prayer or a standing prayer. And it was part of the multiple prayer times that, that they would have throughout the day. As I was doing some research with uh, the Bema podcast and a lot of different Jewish, uh, religious Jewish sites, they talked about the Amidah prayer. The, there's ancient ones and there's even more current ones. And so what Jesus was telling his disciples, basically, you guys know how to pray. Pray. You know how to do it. But Jesus did do something that is different or inserted something in this standing prayer that was different. He's using something familiar to teach him about the revolutionary teaching about forgiving others. Why? How much is Jesus trying to teach them something re revolutionary? Well, forgiving is at the center of the prayer. And this prayer is at the center of the Sermon on the Mount. So if you're a Jewish reader, you pay attention to structure. And as you read the Sermon on the Mount, as you read the prayer, you're realizing that forgiveness is basically at the center of everything. Why? Because forgiveness for the Jewish person was seen as a work of God, not of man. In fact, we see the same thing. God forgive them. Lord forgive them. It's a work of God. But Jesus is saying, hey guys, join me in forgiving people. Not so that when we forgive them, they go to heaven, but we forgive them for ourselves, for what it does to our hearts. Why? Because we get sinned against all the time. 
And Jesus is saying, I'm inviting you to join me in understanding what it means to forgive. And we see this in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 through 35, and we'll get to it later on. But basically, there's a man that owes a king millions of dollars. The man begs for more time and the king forgives him the debt. The king absorbs that millions of dollars debt. He assumes it for this guy and he forgives him his debt, sends him on his way. Then this guy runs into someone that owes him a few months worth of of money and the guy can't pay him back and instead of forgiving him the way he was forgiven he begins to choke the guy he he throws the guy in jail has no mercy no forgiveness no empathy no sympathy no mercy whatsoever the other servants tell the king what happened and the king brings this guy back and puts him in jail and basically says where you've got to pay back everything you owe me because you're wicked, because you didn't extend the same mercy that I extended to you to someone who owed you far less than what you owed me. It's a powerful story. And there's a great sermon, and the link is there, um, great sermon on forgiveness. I'm going to actually hit some of those points but, but if you have a chance to watch that sermon, it's, a, it's an incredible sermon on forgiveness. Why? Because forgiveness is something that I, I think we get wrong. Forgiveness for us, we think uh, it's easy sometimes. Or we think uh, certain things about forgiveness, we, we hold on to things that we're not even aware that we hold on to. But Jesus was trying to get his disciples to forgive. Why? Because we would think prior, or they would think prior to this, well, if God forgives them, that's all that matters. I can hold grudges. I can wish evil. I can do this. I can do that inwardly. And Jesus is like, no, you got to purge yourself of that revenge and that hatred, that bitterness. You got to forgive. And so in this sermon, he makes a point. I believe it's Marty Solomon makes a couple of points of what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not saying that the wrong was trivial or didn't matter. Forgiveness is not saying there aren't consequences to the sin. Forgiveness is not saying what happened was okay. Forgiveness is not saying you shouldn't get help. It, for example, call the police. Forgiveness is not saying you should saying you don't leave the situation. Hey, you know, if you're in a dangerous situation, if you're in an abusive situation, you need to leave, especially if there's sin or abuse going on. You can leave. Forgiveness is not saying you got to stay in that toxic, dangerous, life-threatening situation. Forgiveness is not saying there aren't appropriate boundaries. Okay, and he goes into a lot of these things. So let me just say this before people just start leaving. Okay, <laughs> because I, I know how we think. Well, pastor said we can leave. The law said we can leave. You got to understand what I'm saying. Forgiveness, when we talk about forgiveness, sometimes we can say, well, I don't want to forgive because forgiveness is saying that what was happening was trivial or it wasn't important. Or forgiveness, if I forgive them, then, then what I'm saying is what they did is okay, and it's none of those things. You know what forgiveness is? Forgiveness is refusing to make someone else pay for what they did. So, if someone wrongs you, it's basically ending the revenge cycle. It's not doing the eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. It's ending the revenge cycle and understanding that forgiveness costs, right? If someone wrongs you, if someone hurts you, if someone has done something to you, to forgive them is to take that fault or to take that damage, to take that pain, and not try to inflict it on them, but say, you know what? I'm going to take that pain. I forgive you. But understand, by taking that pain, it's, it's almost like dying. It's suffering. Jesus did it for us. And when, the more we forgive and absorb that cost, 
the greater understanding we have of the suffering that Jesus suffered. And what did Paul say in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 through 11? He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his suffering so that I can know what it means to be resurrected with him. You see, when we absorb that cost, when we, when we say, you know what, I'm not going to make you pay for what you did to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat that cost but I, because I forgive you. We draw close, or we should draw close to Jesus. Because understand, if we don't draw close to Jesus, it's going to result in bitterness, hatred, just a hard heart and a ruined life. So the last thing forgiveness is, it's not being defined by the past. It's not defining people according to their sins. But it's allowing for the potential of change that they can change, that you can change, that the situation can change. But I want to be clear, forgiveness is not continually putting yourself in a position to be wronged. There are toxic, rela toxic relationships because people refuse to repent. I don't think Jesus says you have to keep going in back to those situations. And if you're in an abusive relationship, I don't think Jesus says, hey, go back and just get beat up on and get abused more and more and more. I also don't believe he's saying divorce them. At the bottom line, we need to forgive and we need to work out what it means of that relationship, having the proper boundaries, having the proper precautions. And I know I'm treading on thin ice or treading on lines here, treading, stepping on toes. But Jesus did in I believe if we want to please him, I think we're, we'll be led by his spirit to the right actions. But Jesus says you've got to have the right heart. Because if we don't have the right heart, then the actions are just actions, performance. we got to strive to please God. So, verse 16 when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who has sees what is done in secret will reward you. Again, it's not if you fast, it's when you fast. This is probably one of the most difficult spiritual disciplines that we could engage in. But it's something that we should do. I mean, when's the last time you fasted? When's, and, and that's you'd be a meal, a day, two days, or three days. You always want to get advice if you want to do extended fast. But when's the last time we did it? And bottom line is, we should fast, but we should do it with the right heart. We shouldn't fast to try to get things. Really, when we fast, it's so that we can change to be more in line with God's will, to be closer to God. And so when we fast, let's do it to be close to God, not to be seen by men. Don't act like you're dying, right, when you're fasting. Don't act like you're dying, but live through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you got to understand, everything we're talking about, we need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do. Especially when it comes to forgiveness, which sometimes is not quick. Sometimes it's a process. But we need to engage in that good work of forgiveness, we need to engage in the good work of giving, the good work of fasting. Why? To the glory of God. So people can see it for the glory of God. So what are some practical teachings? Number one, change your audience. Stop doing things for show if you are and start doing things for God for his pleasure so that he can get glorified. Following Jesus is not an act. It is a life that starts from the inside that brings God glory when lived on the outside. We are not to be closet Christians. We are to show the good works so that God can be glorified. We must be changed at the heart level, the inner life, not just our behavior. We must not merely be observers or admirers of Jesus, but we must be followers of Jesus. We must forgive, get rid of bitterness and hate and revenge if we are to be forgiven. And again, this isn't always easy, but we got to engage in that good work, church. Jesus is halfway through the Sermon on the Mount. 
I don't know about you, but I, I feel overwhelmed already. But I know that at the end of this, I want to live a life that's pleasing to God. Regardless of how people feel about me, because if we live a righteous life, we'll be persecuted. But we need to live life to please God. Final note. When it comes to the things that we're facing currently, mask wearing, vaccines, political unrest, social unrest, all these things, everybody has an opinion. Bring back the days where we didn't know everyone's opinion, but everyone has an opinion. Everyone has a blog. Everyone has social media. But I want to talk to the disciples Please don't compartmentalize a Sermon on the Mount from your social media account or from your opinions or from your heart that's behind the opinions or your anger over politics or your unrighteous attitude towards people who don't agree with you. Please don't compartmentalize those things. The Sermon on the Mount is meant to be placed right over all those things. And we're to live as disciples in the midst of all this stuff, masks, no masks, vaccines, no vaccines, Democrat, Republican, and we're supposed to love. We're supposed to think about people. Yeah, but I don't trust the science. I don't trust this. I don't trust that. Trust God. And when people see your life, I pray they don't see hypocrites actors on Sundays, but they see devoted followers of Jesus that live their lives for the glory of God as we do our good works in the eyes of our Father. Remember, change your audience and seek to please God. God bless. Have a great week. Oh, Lord, you see me, my Lord, you know me, you know when I sit and rise. You understand my soul and my spirit, only you are perfectly wise. Please, Lord, search me, test me, try me and know my heart. Look deep into my envious thoughts. See if to any offense I cling, Lord. Lead me in the way everlasting. You knit together all of my being. I was woven by your hand. Your words are mighty that I know full well. Only you created each man. Please, search Lord, me, search me, test me, try me and know my heart. Look deep into my envious thoughts. See if to any offense I cling, Lord. Lead me in the way everlasting, Lord, and lead me in the way everlasting. Hello, my name is Justin Hatmaker, and I'd like to share a communion message with you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 17, Paul talks to the church in Corinth about what communion is. He breaks down some very specific instructions where they were failing to do it correctly. I wanted to share uh, briefly uh, in verse 28 of chapter 11. It says, Look into your own hearts before you eat the bread and drink the cup. Because all who eat the bread and drink the cup without recognizing the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. I really wanted to share about a point in my life where there was a shift in my thinking about who God was and what Jesus meant. Um, I Many of you know my story. I came from some pretty 
messed up things in my my past. Uh, came into the kingdom of God. God blessed me with things that I couldn't have possibly imagined. You know, a, a wife, a son, just joy upon joy. So at one point, uh, my wife and I were trying to have another child. And we were trying and trying and trying, nothing happening. And eventually, uh, one night my wife, you know, woke me up. She wasn't feeling well. We went to the quick care and we found out that she was pregnant right before we found out that she was losing the baby. I would like to say that my faith was strong, that it didn't affect me, that I still could say, God, your will, not mine. That's not where I was. That wasn't my faith at that point. I had to really go out and have one of those Gethsemane moments where you just cry out to God and you say, why, you know, why did this happen? And as I was pouring out my heart to God, I found myself listing out all the things I'd done for the church, all the things I was doing for God's kingdom that I was doing for God. And somewhere along the line, I stopped and I said, you know what? I've gotten this wrong. When I first became a disciple, it was about God being, you know, the Almighty and His forgiveness being this wonderful gift and Jesus being both my Lord and my Savior. And at some point, everything had kind of gotten shifted little by little to where subconsciously God had just become this genie who grants wishes when I rub the lamp in His Son's name. And that's not who God is. You know, I had to really get my thinking back to, you know what, Jesus is Lord. I don't know what God's plans are. I don't see the whole picture. I only see my small piece of it. And I really had to do a lot of soul searching to get back to the place where Jesus was Lord and Savior, you know, and not just expecting things because I was doing stuff, you know, looking for God's blessings as a, a wage that I've worked for. That's not what it is. And to me, communion is something that we do every week. And it's important to keep the focus on why we do it. What did Jesus do? And what do we do with that? How do we internalize that? How do we stay grateful for what we've been given? You know, and if you've been around for a number of years, we do this every week and it gets easy for it to just become a habit Please don't let it be that. Take the time to really reflect on who you are, who you are before God, and what God has done for you, and to remember Jesus' sacrifice. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much just for all that you do for us, all the ways that you protect us and guide us and bless us, even in ways that we don't even remember or think about. Help us to always go back to the cross and remember the sacrifice of your Son and what it really means, and to stay grateful for it, and to not lose sight of that. Just help us to really be the light to the world, and to really bring you glory and honor in everything we do. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.
Hi, my name is Delano Stewart. I serve as the minister here at Valley Christian. If you're watching this video, you're interested in giving. And for that, I want to thank you. Through this video, you'll be given instructions on exactly how to give using our website or using our app. Giving is easier than ever. You can give through the app, like I said, or through our website. Giving from our website will cover first. Go to the church website, valleychristians, with an S, dot org, and click on the Give link at the top right of the page. This will open a pop-up that will allow you to give one time. Just fill out the amount you want to give and what you're giving to. So on that drop-down, you'll be able to give to Weekly Contribution, Hope Las Vegas, or Special Missions, to name a few. Your credit card info should be input or your bank account information can be inputted. And if you want to cover the fees, this option is going to increase your giving slightly, but it will make sure that the amount you want to give will be credited to you. We recommend that you set up an account with Tidely to do recurring giving as it allows you to easily manage your account if you need to change the amount you give or frequency of your giving. To do so, you click on the login sign up link at the top right of the pop up. If you already have an account, you could log on this page. If you don't have an account, click on create an account button and fill in the details to get your account created. Once you have an account set up, you can go through the same process we just got th went through and you can use your account to give. Now, giving through the app. You first need to download the app. You can find it at the Apple Store or on the Google Play Stores. Search for Valley Christian Church app. Download it and open the app. Then click on the Give icon on the bottom right of the page. This will open a web browser that will allow you to give one time or recurring, the same as on the website. You can log in or create an account so you can manage your recurring giving amount or frequency. If you're having any specific problems with giving online, please feel free to contact us through our website contact form. Again, I want to thank you for even considering giving and thank you for your generosity. God bless. Thank you for joining us. We are so glad that you did. If you want more information about Valley Christian, please go to valleychristians.org. That's valleychristians with an S dot org. There you can find more information about us. You can sign up for Bible studies. You can get more information about small groups around the valley if you would like. And you're also able to give online if you would like to do that as well. Again, we are an imperfect people serving a perfect God. Let's journey together. God bless and we'll see you next time.